Hi, welcome. Thanks for uh, braving the uh, suboptimal and inclement weather to be here for uh, what is going to be an exciting talk. Uh, I'm Nico Fee. I'm one of the faculty in emergency medicine. I'm also uh, one of the members of the executive committee at the Center for Global Health. So on behalf of the Center for Global Health, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, and also, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Charles Steinberg. Uh, who is an HIV uh, and global health specialist, uh, practices right here in Boulder. Apparently, he's, he's well known to a lot of you. I'm fairly new here, so he's unknown to me. Uh, and he actually completed his training in pediatric and adolescent medicine uh, right here. And uh, since the mid-80s, uh, has sort of gained a lot of expertise in HIV uh, care and subsequently uh, has done a, a tremendous amount of global health work, both research, educational, capacity building, uh, and a lot of places in the world, Central and South America, Eastern Europe, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And today he's going to be sharing his experiences with us, um, uh, sort of from a six-week uh, stint in uh, Sierra Leone uh, as the uh, medical director, or oh, sorry, the, the medical coordinator uh, in an Ebola treatment unit or an Ebola treatment center in Sierra Leone. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Steinberg. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the great introduction. You know, the truth is, I send a bio here, and that's one of the very first times somebody used to read the bio, but I read it ahead of time and synthesized it all into two or three really clear sentences. And you'd write me a bio, right? That would be a great thing to have. So, and thank you all for showing up. The most expensive seats are still available in the front. So feel free to come on up and grab one. This is going to be a little bit more personal talk than some of the talks I've given to this group and here at the university. And I am happy for you to interrupt me starting now. But anytime along the way, if I say something or if we talk about something, please just if you want to add to it or ask about it. Because I think the, you've had lectures on Ebola, and you know a lot already of the science. And I think what I have to offer you is just to share my personal experience of what it was like in that situation. And I think you can even see from the expression on my face, it wasn't a jolly good time. It was probably one of the most focused and intense times I've spent. And that idea of focusing and being vigilant and having your energy in one place thinking about exactly what you're doing. I mean, certainly in emergency medicine, you get in that situation. Um, but a lot of times in medicine, you sort of lay back a little bit, and you're thinking about this, and checking your emails, and talking to people. I mean, when I was in Sierra Leone, you know, I paid attention to where I put my hands. You know, with the thought, who else has got their hands there before me, and what am I picking up? And I know that sounds a little germ-phobic, but in an Ebola outbreak, you get pretty germ-phobic. Similarly, I didn't do a lot of touring. You know, I've talked to you about my work in Uganda and East Africa where I went to the game parks and the cool places. I just stayed at a place where I stayed and went to the units that I worked at. And I didn't go to markets to buy food, somebody else did that for me. You know, because one of the exposure risks is out in the community. In fact, that's probably a more worrisome one because you don't know what you're dealing with and right in the heart of the highest risk zone of the Ebola treatment unit where you know what you're dealing with and you're putting on all the protective gear. Um, I would tell you that there's no place safer in the world than inside that PPE. <laughs> it's dangerous getting out of it, but once you're inside of it, it's quite safe. So let me tell you a little bit about my experience and we will just go through it. And You know, it was about the middle of October I saw this editorial, which I don't expect you to read in the New England Journal, about the Ebola emergency, and that was just the time um, that I was signing up with IMC, International Medical Corps, to go to Sierra Leone, and that was thanks to this global health department you know, sending out a, a flyer about IMC calling for doctors. And what this article talks about is something like, uh, you know that West Africa is going to see more suffering and many more deaths from everything else because the whole health infrastructure has shut down. All the hospitals and clinics and TB centers and HIV centers and OB centers, places where people could, if they got there, get a modicum of care, all were shut down. 
So people are really going to suffer and a real danger of complete breakdown. Meanwhile, I arrive in Freetown and I walk along the beach and here's a guy with an outdoor gym. I'm a workout buff and I look, I could get a workout here. And then I look and he doesn't have any hand cleaning stuff between all the machines. I mean, there were old machines and all that that I could deal with. But it seemed to me, you know, other people working out, me working out. They did take your temperature going into the gym, but I decided not to work out there. Here's another paragraph on that page trying to figure out why this epidemic was so different. When I learned about Ebola, it was like, oh, you'll get 25 cases or maybe 300 cases, and it'll burn itself out. People will get sick and die, and they won't travel very far. So some of the factors that went into this devastating epidemic, it wasn't a different virus, but this uh, paragraph mentions that it, dysfunctional healthcare systems, international indifference, and we'll talk more about that, Population mobility, we can talk more about. Customs, we should talk about. The densely populated capitals where it started and the lack of trust to the government and the authorities and the health authorities simply because of a 10-year previous uh, where they stopped trusting the government. Uh, well, meanwhile, here's this flag of an Ebola sensitization and training thing outside of the health clinic, all in a shambles. Sort of gives you a, an image for it. And this image, Ebola is real. I mean, there had to be a, a very intense effort, and there still is, on the part of the health authorities to convince the people that, hey, this is really going on. This isn't witchcraft. Some of the other crazy theories about what it is that you've been cursed, or that there was one theory that a plane load of witches crashed in Sierra Leone, and that's what spread it. I mean, you can just imagine what people's minds will do if all of a sudden everybody in your family is falling over sick and dying. So Ebola is real also had to be uh, projected on the world stage. As you know, it was slow for the WHO to acknowledge that this was a real catastrophe. It was slow for organizations to respond to MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, who was there. They were there uh, early on, really since March. Uh, trying to get in front of this and realizing they were losing ground everywhere. So this Ebola is real message. I know you've had the lectures that have given you the medical information. I just wanted to mention that the CDC has great slides online so you can see what kind of virus, one of these phytal viruses or thread-like viruses that Ebola and Marburg are. You can review the life cycle of how it lives in bats on your left and then gets transferred to other animals and gets transferred to human beings and uh, something about the biology of it. I didn't want to show you the CDC slides, um, but to suggest to you that this area that's uh, highly infected, and this is from, I think, early January, this picture, um, there are three countries there and a, and a few others on the edges. The borders are not like borders we think about. It's totally porous. This is just, you know, savanna and jungle and you don't know what country you're in, and people travel back and forth on buses, and so, and they all speak the same language. They all more or less have the same customs, and so this epidemic really spread across international borders. As I drove across, I would see something like this looking out my windshield, and this is really the message trying to get to the people to stop the virus at three different levels. Your own practices and behaviors, your family's practices and what they're doing, uh, you particularly, I'm, I'm sure you know there was like a, a, a somebody dies, a lot of cleansing and touching the body and kissing the body, and a Ebola infected person who's died is teeming with virus. That's like the highest, highest load on a dead person. I'd also point out a <coughs> thing in the way in this picture that I'm taking through the windshield for those of you who can read backwards. It's giving me uh, permission to go across quarantine lines in this vehicle that's allowed to pass letters are. Because as you drive along again and again, you find places where the road is closed. And actually from 5 in the afternoon till 9 the next morning, it's completely closed to anybody except emergency response people. So uh, the vehicles start to line up and it can be a long, long line. Um, this is coming through one uh, that had stopped at about uh, 5 and we're there at about 6 or so. When you do go through them, there's a guy with one of these thermometers taking your temperature and they're not very well trained. Um, they'll point it anywhere and get any sort of reading. And it took me a lot, actually, when I was training our nurses to learn how to use these thermometers correctly and hold them the right distance. With somebody like Gilbert, my colleague and friend, 
Um, they didn't have a clue about how they could get up to his forehead to take his temperature. Um, one of the places I went to was the MSF clinic, the Doctors Without Borders clinic in Bo in Sierra Leone, and that's where um, I worked and also received a lot of training. Um, this picture gives you the impression that there's a helipad, a helicopter pad in the front, which there was, but I mostly wanted you to notice the three tents in back, because there are three basic wards that these kind of units set up, and I'll show you about them in a minute. There are also tents full of supplies. This is Dr. Evita from the Netherlands working with MSF and showing one of my colleagues, Bob, and me around. I think we saw two or three tents full of supplies. And that's one thing I'd really want to comment on, and I'll show you later with another treatment unit. But think about the logistical hassle and nightmare of setting this up basically in the middle of the jungle. So you're setting up everything from a plumbing system and a chlorine water system to a waste disposal system to a water drainage system to outhouses to how to deal with infectious waste to how to get all this PPE equipment and all the other medical equipment you need in the same place at the same time with trained people who know how to deal with it all. It's huge. And it took a while. It took a long while. One of the things you see all over is uh, chlorine to wash your hands with, and you quickly learn the different percentages. This is 0.05%, which is a little irritating to the skin, but not bad, and kills Ebola virus just fine. There's also 10 times as strong, or 0.5%, and I'll show you that's what gets sprayed on you or washed on you when you have some protection and you're just decontaminating yourself. At the MSF unit, there's a, a like a treatment center or a, a, a doctor's and nurse's room where they have these whiteboards with a little line or two about each patient. They have a system of, of grading patients of zero to five, which is a little like the Karnofsky scale or other scales you've learned of how sick people are. But you can read how you could rank people pretty quickly and know, gee, they're getting sick, they're getting really sick, or they're getting better. And then they also had this colored system of pens using blue for people who are getting better and red for people who are getting sick, but I noticed they didn't follow it. Here was a, a <coughs> three people who were getting ready for discharge that they used in red. But you can see the numbering system is zero, the code for how well they're doing. Um, as you go around these kind of units, you see places where the laundry's got to be done, where the boots have to be uh, sanitized every day, goggles are recycled, aprons are recycled, so a huge end of it is laundry. Um, and the main thing you learn, you learn a little bit about the virus, but you mostly learn how to put on and how to take off this outfit, which has lots of layers. In fact, lots of redundancy <coughs> to prevent healthcare worker infection. One of the Chief priorities, in fact, the chief priority at an Ebola treatment unit is taking care of the healthcare workers. It's a little interesting and different than the way we think as doctors and as nurses, where we sometimes put ourselves on the line to help take, take care of the patient. It's a much clearer line of take care of yourself first and 100% before you take care of the patient. And make sure you're protecting yourself because there's just no slack if you get exposed to Ebola, you're going to, as an expatriate, get shipped back to the U.S. and be in one of these weird intensive care centers, and you're going to be on the side looking at everybody in spacesuits and, and, and outfits instead of... So you want to avoid that. You want to take care of yourself. And there's really a guideline that if you're in the unit and you're getting too hot or you're getting faint, get out of there. And it's not uh, a negative thing. It's not, you know, there's no heroics involved. It's worth mentioning, and now what goes on in the unit is quite debatable, and you're probably on top of this debate. Um, you could almost say, well, what goes on in the old MSF centers, and they don't even call them treatment units, they call them management centers, case management centers, because they would argue there's no treatment for the world. But what they're trying to do is isolate the patients from the community and do the best they can to support their fluid hydration status and their electrolyte status without much intervention other than oral rehydration salts and the occasional IV. That's one polarity. Another is if you think what goes on at every university or some of these big places that are treating Ebola that do everything. They'll put a patient on dialysis, they'll put a patient on a respirator, they'll do blood tests every day, all this sort of stuff at a biosafety level four, meaning you know, there's just a lot of limits to what you can do. In the Ebola treatment units in West Africa, you basically don't do blood tests, period, except the Ebola PCR. It's one test. 
and that's done at the beginning to make sure the person has it, and at the end it gets negative, so you, the person survives, you do it several times over 72 hours before you let them out into the world saying they're not contagious. So that one blood draw is the only one that happens. Nobody's checking a potassium level or a hemoglobin or any of the basic things you sort of know to do what you're doing to flush in liters of, of Ringer's lactate if you were to get an IV going. And in fact, whether to keep an IV line going is quite debatable. It's really challenging. The way it works is you put on an outfit like this, and um, I don't need to just show me, I can show other people in outfits. <laughs> um, and you go into the unit for about an hour. And depending on how many patients there are, at the MSF clinic where I was, it was quite busy. And there might have been 60 or 70 patients that two doctors were looking at over an hour. So that might have been 30 patients each in an hour. So you, you're doing the math with me. It's a couple minutes to say hello, to evaluate the patient. I'm sort of a touchy-feely doctor that likes to know patients and likes to know their stories and what happened. And I didn't get much satisfaction of that. Mostly it was you know, very simple stuff like, are you throwing up and are you having diarrhea and do you hurt anywhere? And trying to figure out what we could do in the immediate moment. Um, and as I was saying, you know, if I'm going through and I help a nurse and we start an IV and we get it all taped down, Somebody might spend the whole hour just holding it up, squeezing it in more like a bolus than waiting for it to drip in because there's there weren't any IV poles, number one, but there, there isn't any nurse to monitor or watch it or somebody, and patients are, are um, confused and moving around and pulling out anything that irritates them. So you, know, you almost have to be there to keep an IV going. So I'm trying to paint for you a debate because um, Partners in Health in that group has tried to say, no, we can do more. We can do like in the West where we really do IV treatment and we follow blood levels of potassium and hemoglobin and all that. And they're debating and experimenting and trying to see whether it can be done in the setting where, you know, it's 95 degrees outside that suit. And I don't know, but like a, a sweaty, sweaty, sweaty sauna inside that suit. Um, when I would get out of that, I'll show you a picture in a while, I'd be just completely drenched. I would pour sweat out of my boots, you know, a cupful out of each boot, literally. You'd, get, you'd lose a, a couple liters of water over an hour. So that is combined with the other thing I want to mention, which is, uh, I guess, the, the potential lethality of sharps. You know, when we start an IV here, we're really careful, and we pay attention to what we do with that needle, and it goes right in a sharps container, and we've learned that since the 80s. Um, when HIV taught us universal precautions. Um, it isn't the practice in many places in Africa, and the nurse might start, or doctor might start an IV and put the catheter needle just in the mattress while they're working on it, just stick it in the mattress or something like that, or throw it on the floor or something like that. So teaching people to use a sharps container and then doing it safely, because a stick with blood on it from Ebola, well, let me jump back if you remember the HIV lectures. A stick with blood from HIV your chances of getting HIV are like three out of a thousand. But a stick with blood from Ebola, your chances are really good you're going to get Ebola. So you, you can't do that. And so that's argued the back step of, well, if we're going to take care of ourselves first, we're not going to do a lot of blood tests, we're not going to start a lot of IVs. So anyhow, I want you to know that dynamic is going on of how much should we do. I didn't mention the fact that in the West where we do all this stuff, we're in air-conditioned hospitals and you're comfortable, whereas here, you know, you're in miserable heat and sweating, sweating, sweating. When you come in or out of any of the units or ready to leave, you step through these chlorine baths. Now, this is the 0.5%, which is hopefully disinfecting your boots from the bottom of your cuffs down. And I thought I'd show you a few pictures about taking off your outfit. It's called doffing. We could go over donning and doffing, and if you ever do any of this, you'll learn. Um, but just to show you how it goes on there, you come into this room and you've got a guy on the left in scrubs and an apron and a mask to protect him from splash. And he's spraying 0.5% chlorine, strong stuff. And first you're washing your hands with it. And then he's spraying your entire front surface. And then you turn around and he's spraying your entire back surface. So you're getting really decontaminated on the outside already with really strong chlorine, 10 times stronger than it would take to kill the virus. So that's pretty, you know what I'm saying, pretty redundant on top of all these layers of plastic and rubber and things that are protecting you. You'll notice he, um, he's still got on his tan uh, surgical gloves because you're going to take those off next, and I don't have pictures of all the steps. But once those are off and he's got his blue gloves showing, and you can see the sort of hook that goes from the yellow suit around the finger to keep the sleeves down, he's taking off the apron really carefully. 
and trying to just touch it either on the strap or on the inside, but not on the front where it might be contaminated. And we took those aprons and we put them in 0.5% chlorine and they were going to get washed and reused. These are not disposable. Um, the goggles come off next and we're doing that really carefully. And what I mean carefully is you're pulling them off, you don't want it to even snap because that snap spreads spray and you could spray it around to the guy who's helping you or something like that. So you're doing it gently but carefully. Between each step you're going over to the 0.5% 0.5 chlorine and washing your hands. And now he's still got his hood on and his mask on, but he's getting off any contamination that he had on his hands. And then the hood comes off. And I found this very problematic because the hoods were tied with strings and we broke the strings in back. And depending on how you did the strings, this is a little un ungood. <laughs> This is a little not good, excuse me, that that strap is dragging across his hair. I mean, that's a potentially contaminated outer thing now that's, and, and when we saw that anyhow, we would tell people at the end to just go rinse their hair in 0.5%, 0.05%. You can see what I mean. The dilute one, uh, if they thought it was getting in their hair. But washing his hands between each step and then pulling open the sticky part of this uh, Tyvek suit or Tychem suit, depending on which kind you had. And then there's, you see there's a zipper at the top, and he's going to reach up and slowly unzip that and scoot out of it um, without pushing the, the neck collar part into his skin. So you're just getting careful with the zipper and not touching your skin with anything. And once the flap is open, you wash your hands again. And again, he's got to keep his head up and that flap open or his chin's going to bang into the outside of the garment. And then you wiggle it around and push your arms down from the inside and push it down. And your helper who's spraying and helping you is saying, you know, don't touch your scrub suit with your hands. Don't touch your boots. And you're pushing it down. And you get it around your ankles. And then you have this amazing move where you sort of step on it and kick out of it. And it takes a while. Um, and you start slipping. And you can see the floor is just sopping with uh, chlorine solution. And you're in rubber boots, so you might as well be skating. And at the same time, you really don't want to fall. That red edge is an imaginary real line between the high-risk zone and the low-risk zone. And I mean, in the unit, there's no no-risk zone. But the idea is keep everything high-risk on that side. So if you just remember all this, you may be familiar with what it's like when they doff and don in the West. I've watched the CDC videos you can get. This is just a screenshot of one of the videos. Every step of the way is on a video that you can watch from the CDC. And it's just really interesting to notice the difference. Welcome. Um, how we do it in the West is so tidy. You know, everything is, is clean and neat. There's no chlorine splashing over everything. In the back, you can see one of those uh, dispensers of hand cleaning stuff. And that's what's used to do your hands each time. That's what's used to sterilize anything or decontaminate anything. You have a helper that's helping you out of your suit. There's nothing like that in West Africa. Everything the person has been wearing is just going in one red trash bag. There's nothing that's being recycled. So that at the end, it's all in a tidy little bag, whereas at the end in West Africa, it's a huge mess. And I, I think there's a comment there about the whole system and the whole culture that we have everything here so tidy and neat. And if you've walked around anywhere in Africa, you know you've got to watch your step and make sure you're not going to fall on the floor. Things just aren't as tidy. And that comes out in the uh, donning and doffing as well. So that last step, which I found interesting because I have balance challenges, is you have to stand on one foot while they spray the back of that foot and underneath that, and that goes over the red line. And this one comes up on the near side of the red line. you got to get it up there and keep it up there while he sprays it long enough, and then he clears you and you get up. And then somebody hands you some water, and you've just come out of an hour in the unit, and you're exhausted. Does that make sense, just to talk about it? I'll show you some more in a minute. So about the time I was learning all this at MSF, um, IMC, who I was m m working with, had already picked out a site a couple months before to build a unit. And by the time I first saw it, I thought, how on earth is this going to be done? And a week later, it was pretty well done. And um, again, you can see tents. And I, I got an aerial picture. All of these I've been taking, but this one I obviously didn't take, uh, of the unit. And I just wanted to be able to show you, let's see if my pointer works with this. Yeah. This is the low-risk side. I put this red line here, and then these are the three tents that are the high-risk side. 
I'm going to dull out that red line so I can show you better what's going on behind it. In this room, we're getting our gear on. Is my arrow showing? Good. So in this room, we're putting on the gowns and the hoods and the masks and the gloves, and there's a total order you do this so that everything's careful and, and whatever. And then you walk through some chlorine to get into the hallway that takes you to these three units. And they're divided where people who maybe have Ebola, they have some symptoms of it, or it's called a probable case, are here. But there are probably some people here who were waiting on a test who don't have Ebola. This is a scary place because people who don't have Ebola might be getting exposed to it, but what are you going to do? And then these are much more uh, sure cases, and these are confirmed cases. And as you travel through the unit, you only go that direction. You always go from sort of the less risky to the more risky. And you never go backwards. If you've gotten in there and you thought, oh, I needed to bring blah, 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 and I forgot it, a piece of paper or something, they can, I'll show you how they can hand it through, or you just don't have it. Um, and anything you take into the unit, you don't take out. So I'm going to show you some interesting pictures, but I'll explain to you how I got them, because I really couldn't take my camera in, in the high-risk area. Um, no matter how many plastic bags I put it in or how I could figure out how to do it. And then when we're done, there are these areas here, these two white areas, were where the uh, doffing stations were. And there were two in each little roofette there. So there were four places people could come out at a time. And the idea is, once you're done, you really do want to get out of your outfit. You don't want to wait in line for 10 minutes. And it's heat continuing to sweat. So we tried to keep the outgoing, the doffing line, really working. So as they were finishing this, I was involved in training. Um, we were practicing putting on this stuff and helping the others learn and mostly helping nurses and the cleaning people, the sanitation people that do a lot of the work learn how, how to do this stuff. And the morale and the spirit when we're doing this, here's my friend Gilbert again from uh, the Congo. You can just see as a up spirit, we'd just gotten the gear because, you know, we were trying to practice and we didn't have all the right gear. People were taking selfies of themselves. They put the gear on. They want to get a picture of themselves because this is, you know, practice. And the reason I wanted to show you all these pictures is this, this um, jovial sort of nature goes away right away once you realize, hey, I'm going to take care of a patient now. This isn't a game. Did I do it right? This is for real. I have to do it right to take care of myself. So I wouldn't have been able to show you this except this is practice. We're practicing receiving an ambulance. Somebody's coming and the back of the ambulance is sprayed with chlorine. The inside of the doors are decontaminated long before we help the person out. And some of the stuff I'm looking at, I mean, you can see this person's got a mask on. The way that mask covers everything has to be perfect. And if there's this little bit of, uh, there it is, skin showing, that's not okay. So we're always watching each other and saying, hey, your mask isn't right. You can't adjust it because then you'd be taking contaminated hands and contaminating your mask. You don't touch your face when you're in the unit. So it really means you've got to leave and go out and wait a while and come back. Um, when an ambulance comes in, somebody can come in uh, very light covering. He's just got on gloves and a mask and stay a meter away from the ambulance driver who has theoretically not got Ebola because he stayed in the front of the ambulance and the patient stayed in the back and they didn't interact. And we're just taking basic um, demographic information first to make sure we're receiving the correct patient. But the reason we're practicing is these doctors are used to being informal and relaxed, and this is a complete no-no. This doctor wandered in and wanted to help and leaning and talking to the ambulance driver and let him go through it, and I got a picture of it, and then we were able to talk to him about it. You don't want to be touching any of that. For all you know, the family got around the ambulance when the person was picked up, and the outside of the ambulance isn't a safe place to be leaning or the person. Then if you could have been in the unit, you'd see things like this. This is all in training. So this is an actor acting as a patient while well, we're training these nurses and, and aides in, in how to move patients, how to get them up off the floor and so forth. And um, I was able to take pictures during all of these trainings. Uh, here's helping somebody who's pretending that they're vomiting. But believe me, this happens all, all the time in the unit. So doctors and the nurses needed a little practice and training and getting the bucket in the right place, encouraging fluids, things like that. So once we started doing this, I wasn't taking pictures anymore. We are just doing it, including drawing a blood. And here's a lot of practice for that. There's a chlorine bottle spray. You know, once the blood is drawn, 
it's in a tube. The outside of that tube is not only labeled, but then sprayed, and then the inside of a bag is sprayed, and then it's put in the bag, and then the outside of that bag is sprayed, and then another bag. I think it ends up in three or four bags by the time it ends up in the box that leaves the unit. But we were trying to train people in using a sharps container, and I couldn't believe my eyes. You know, here's what this young doctor was doing. And I was thinking, yeah, they've never had experience using sharps containers. So this was a great teachable moment of, you know, let's, let's put the pointy end in first. Um, and then one of the hardest things to watch and to be part of was when we'd find somebody who had died and what would happen for him. And here's one picture of that in practice where um, the body is wrapped in a, a blanket and then that's sprayed with chlorine and then that's put in one of these heavy-duty white plastic body bags and the outside of that is sprayed with chlorine and then it's put in another body bag and sprayed with chlorine and then the, the guys can take it to the morgue and to a safe burial. This is one of the biggest ways to prevent the spread was to control when people died how the burial was done in a safe way. These are unmarked graves because literally the family would come and dig them up and want to do the ritual stuff afterwards. So they had to be, you know, they're not mass graves, they're unmarked single graves. Um, and just to mention it, the death rate was somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. You know, about half of the people who would arrive would die. So the day before that center opened, President Bai Karoma visited. He's the president of Sierra Leone. And I had nothing to do with it, but I just sort of walked into the middle of it and somebody got my picture. So it looked like I'm with the president of Sierra Leone. And then here's the first patient arriving. You know, I'm far away with a zoom lens so I could take this picture. And I blacked out the face completely for, for confidentiality purposes. But you see a lot in this picture. You see the nurses helping this uh, young girl. She was 15 and she did survive. Um, her brother did not. But you can see they're walking her into the unit through a side way and the sanitation people are behind her with their sprayers and they're spraying everywhere she walked and everywhere she stepped. So we try and keep the load down. And as we're dressing to go help this patient, it's not that jovial look anymore. You can see how somber I look and how my, my friend Harrison looks, uh, who's helping me. You always have a buddy. Um, he would then probably be getting dressed and we'd be going in together and always working together and watching things together and coming out together. So you worked as buddies. I want to remind you, you can interrupt me anytime. I love questions. Yeah. Professionals have the numbers written on there. Beautiful, thank you. So you write that when you go in, the time that you Brilliant, are. yeah, so you write the time, somebody writes for you that you're going in so that somebody can say, hey, you've been in here an hour, get out of here. And then your name, right here. Yeah. I think you can probably see Charles um, backwards, as I'm in the mirror here, shooting my picture. Um, so that people could recognize each other. Otherwise, particularly with a dark-skinned person behind the goggles, you know, it's hard to know who to Tell who's who. Yeah, I mean, not, not like to the second, but yeah. mostly by then you want to get out. And that doffing process I showed you takes, if you're fast, 10 minutes, and if you're slow, 15 minutes. So if you wait until you're really hypotensive and dehydrated and feel like you're going to keel over, you've waited too long. But you don't want to wimp out either. You know, I had the experience that the first time, the first couple times I put on that gear, it was so hot and oppressive and sweaty and a little claustrophobic and a, very unpleasant and um, I couldn't wait to get out of it. But later on and by the end, it was like really comforting to put it on. It was like, oh, it's, it's, this is safe. This is fine. And, you know, the heat wasn't a worry anymore. At the beginning, it was like, hey, I'm 67. Can I tolerate this? Am I going to fall over and be the first guy that faints in the unit? Um, and by the way, there weren't many people my age there. There were mostly young emergency medicine doctors or the people who show up for this kind of thing. Doctors in their 30s and 40s. And, um, yeah. How long would it be before you go back in again after you came? In a, in a six-hour shift, because the sh day shifts were short and the night shifts were long, uh, we might go in twice. You know, rarely three times, just because it's too hot. Um, the work we can do early in the morning, like the night shifts, 6 a.m. goes around and draws any bloods that have to be done, then it's a little cooler. That's a great time to try and start an IV. It might be in the low 80s. Um, but, but middle of the day, it's getting really hot. In fact, the next picture is somebody took of me once I got out of that out of it. And I literally, you know, completely drenched in sweat getting real personal for a minute. When I would go there for the day, I would bring two or three pairs of socks and underwear. 
because at this point I just didn't take off everything and put on you know dry off and put on dry stuff again and, and this is when I would have boots full of sweat I'm going yeah thank you for I missed this because I watched it a little late but how long did you stay there how long is the two American doctors end up staying down there what's the Great. continuity I want to take a step back to answer that question. You know, Dr. Berman's office sent out this flyer saying IMC is looking for doctors in October. And you know, I got right on the phone and I got right on the list. I talked it over a lot with my family, with my wife, with my son, and with my daughter. And they had some concerns and we talked about them. And I got to the place where I could reassure them it was safe. I felt safe about it. But mostly I had just a compelling drive to go. And it reminded me of like 1983 and AIDS, when we didn't know anything, we didn't know how it was spread even, we didn't know how to treat it, we didn't know what was going to happen, we didn't know if we were going to get it, but we knew we needed to show up. And it just felt the same to me. And, and quite honestly, if you call IMC right now, or Doctors Without Borders right now and said, I'd love to go over to West African volunteer, they'd say, we don't need you. They have enough volunteers, and the numbers are starting to come down. You want to hear a coincidence, I was driving through this mess, from Boulder, and my phone rings. I don't usually answer my phone, but it had um, a country code 232, so I thought, that's Sierra Leone. I punched the button, and I have a speaker. And I was talking to one of the docs I work with. One of these guys this is my buddy, and he told me, at this point, you know, at the peak, the unit had up to like 40 or 50 patients. It's now got six patients in this area of Lunsar in Sierra Leone. It's an old mining area. Uh, the other clinic has about 24 patients, but think about all this effort to contain this thing, and then it's over. I have a doctor friend um, from Yale um, who I work together with and I'm friends with. I'm going to get your question. <laughs> um, and I work together with him in Uganda. And when I first thought of this after I talked to Dr. Berman, I called him to just, and he thought it was such a good idea, he volunteered. And um, he went with a group called AmeriCares um, because what, what the groups decided is rather than MSF doing everything, they would train people and other groups who come, Partners in Health, AmeriCares, Save the Children. Each of these groups took on a couple of these treatment units. Um, but he got over there, he went through an extensive training actually with International Medical Corps in Liberia next door. And then um, they went through this process I was showing you of training people and setting up the unit. And nobody came. I mean, they literally never saw a patient. And um, he and I were there at the same time. We actually bumped into each other at the airport by coincidence. But he was pretty frustrated in terms of having, you know, sort of, we have this phrase, stringing and unstringing my guitar, but never making any music. That's, you know, the idea of getting, getting ready and all that. So when I did it, they were hard up for doctors. And they cut me a sweet deal of, you know, we'll take you for six weeks. And, you know, we'll give you a per diem, which was helpful, and we'll give you your airfare, and your this and your that. You know, so it was easy for me to do. Right now, if they were taking people, like um, some of you probably know David Cohn, who's been with Denver Health. He's over there right now, the same place I was. It's just brilliant. Um, but he's going to be there for three months. They, they don't want six-week people anymore. They don't want three-month people. And, you know, doctors on the borders used to say we want doctors for two years. Then they got down to six months, and then they were taking people for six weeks, too, for a while, just to fill the emergency. I think I'm talking too long. The slides are going to start doing something. Um, so that's how long you go for. And right now you get on a waiting list, and they might let you know. Oh, I mentioned to you, how would you pass things in and out? So there's an occasional hole between the low-risk zone and the high-risk zone. Um, she's in the low-risk zone, handing food in very carefully, not to touch anything, but to just drop those on the tray, and then the person on the inside is going to take them around. So, just a few more comments about what it's like in this unit. Um, here's a picture that isn't mine, but is from um, the New York Times because it showed so much of what I wanted to say. It's a mess. I mean, people are on the floor. Often, they've just gotten tired. Ebola, I don't know what you've heard in the lectures, but it causes an incredibly profound weakness. I mean, so much fatigue that a person could probably not raise their arm to drink. That's why we're there helping them drink. Uh, the effect on the musculature and the nervous system is just this incredible, profound, profound lethargy. So people end up on the floor not out of laziness. They just can't do anything. They're there. They're stuck. And they're probably thrown up there, and they've probably pooped there, and they've probably peed there all. And you can see multiple areas would have been cleaned up. This is all done with 0.5% um, chlorine because it's all highly infectious 
uh, waste material, and then, you know, in full PPE, the doctors and the nurses are helping the patients literally just back into bed. And so if you've got two, two minutes with a patient and your job is to help them into bed and cover up the poop and the vomitus and spray it for the cleaning people to come in and deal with, but at least to contain it, there's your two minutes. Well, you know, so you maybe had time to help this little girl drink or something like that. So, Charles, I yeah. have two questions. If, uh, if it sounds like the only thing that we done was to try and get ORS into these patients. And uh, I guess the first question is, did you really need doctors who were in the hot zone? Uh, did you even need nurses? I mean, could there be a different level of skilled people? And from the standpoint of medical training, uh, you know, what do you think the appropriate level of caregiver is? Yeah. And the other question <coughs> that's really related to that is the New York Times said there was a huge between the, a group partners we who watch IVs I, I, yeah. and the others that said IVs create so much problems with MSF. Uh, you have thoughts about that? So this is the controversy I mentioned. Dr. Berman walked in just after we talked about it. Between how invasive and intensive of a care do you do? Do you try and do IVs for everybody? You draw bloods and try and set up a machine that can run a potassium under the hood and be safe and everything like that. Um, MSF has been sort of the, the kingpin of this because they've been doing all the little epidemics around all of Africa um, for 30 years. And they've come to this policy of sort of minimal as much as we can without risking the healthcare worker. When you see the numbers, by the way, and you see, gee, out of these cases, 500 healthcare workers infected. There are numbers like that. Um, I didn't want you to worry too much about the healthcare workers that are in the treatment units in PPE because those aren't the healthcare workers that are at risk. It's the poor healthcare worker guy or woman who's out in the periphery in the clinic, maybe at a TB clinic or a malaria center or something like that, who's hitting Ebola patients and everything and they don't know it and they're not adequately covered and protected and exposed. Um, so to get back to your question, I wondered why I was there some of the time as a doctor because anybody could walk around saying, please drink, please drink. The main thing I did as a doctor that maybe they wouldn't want other people doing quite honestly was saying how oh, that person's dead. They would call us to confirm a death. You know, before the people come with the spray and put you in a bag, it's nice for somebody with some ability to do the things you have to do to say this person's really dead and that may be no, no response to stimulation, including deep pain kind of stimulation, and you know, no pulse, and no respiration, and so that kind of thing. I wondered, you know, well, gee, wouldn't you listen to their heart? You can't use a stethoscope. You know, that would penetrate the PPE. So I didn't need a stethoscope. I didn't have to worry about being a little hard of hearing because we well, use a stethoscope. Um, so you could have a cadre of people involved. Then, you know, the ideal cadre would be survivors of Ebola because they could still wear a modified PPE, but they could be a little less thoroughly protected uh, as we learn about their immunity and we think that it's uh, effective immunity because they've already survived Ebola uh, for some of this. And um, it's an open question. I don't have a good answer about how intensive the care can be. I do think we know that in the U.S., most people who have been treated here, it's a small number, have survived. You know, one of the docs was in Sierra Leone, was another buddy of mine from Uganda, and he was the one who came over to Emory and was hospitalized for four weeks, and they never released his name until he released his book. Um, but he was on a respirator for 12 days, he was on dialysis, I mean, all sorts of stuff that saved his life. And then once you're done and you're recovered, you're not all better. There's chronic muscle problems, chronic arthritis, there's all the sort of sequelae that can happen after a serious viral infection that's pretty much wreaked havoc on all of the organ systems. So, I don't know. Um, I think that in the heat and with the air, you just can't do it. Um, in the air conditioning in here, you can. And you know, as we learn more, we'll have fewer numbers and more resources. I mean, one of the questions I asked this doctor who called me this morning as I was driving here is, 
what are they talking about doing with you? There's only six patients left in the unit in this hot spot of Sierra Leone. And I have been watching the numbers, and they report them by week, and they've been like six or 800 new cases a week, and now it's down to like 300 new cases a week in the last two weeks. So if we're really getting in front of it, what are they going to do with this you know, $9 million unit they built and all the resources they pulled together and all the people he trained? He said what they're talking about is they're going to go out in the community and start rebuilding the infrastructure and get everything working again and help who's there left uh, to, to get the TB and the maternity and all those kind of care, HIV care, chronic care, malaria care, those kind of things going again. So that may be what happens with the unit, but um, I don't know how much more intensive you could do uh, treatment-wise. It's just too hot, too uncomfortable. You know, they have they have suits in some of these centers here in the West. They have little fans and air conditioners in them and space suits and all that stuff. Sort of but that just didn't happen there. It hasn't yet. Lynn. The uh, fellow who founded Partners in Health is half of this controversy. Paul Farmer has a lovely book, if you haven't read it, called Mountains Beyond Mountains. The uh, crazy kid wrote it about uh, farmers' work in Haiti mostly. But he, he talks about the patient in front of you. And Farmer has done an incredible job all over the world in getting services out as far as possible with the least amount of training that, that you can possibly get away with. But the idea that we give second-class service to people in developing areas is something that really riles him. And it, it really, I think all of us who are in healthcare or who have been overseas could get a lot out of that, just dealing with the, that discussion internally. No, I really agree. And the, the way you, many of you are trained as doctors and nurses and public health people, uh, having a lot of compassion for each patient and for each individual. I can remember in the AIDS clinics in Uganda, one of the things I really worked hard with the nurses was just a simple thing that they didn't go to the door and yell the name of the next patient down the hall. But they walked out and they looked for the person or they spoke the name gently. As I used to say, imagine that's your mother out there. How would you like her greeted and welcome? So, I mean, that kind of compassion. That didn't happen in the treatment units, honestly. You know, imagine you've got a couple layers of plastic covering your ears and a couple layers of one of the things I thought to do for talks like this, if I could do it, was to get the PPE gear on and show you what it's like, because even basic communication was yelling. Oh, and I, I showed you that picture of that guy, but I didn't tell you what he was doing. Once you've made your rounds and you, you know, you've got a piece of paper where you've got a vertical column for each patient and you circle the symptoms they're having and give them the numeric score, you've got to get that information out somehow. And you can't carry it with you when you go out. So we yelled it across the fence to somebody who had another form and was copying it down. And when I left, they were going to experiment with taking pictures of it with a good camera. They even had some waterproof tablets, and they were going to try and set up an intranet and have you know electronic communication of information. But I, I don't know how that's worked out at all. That would help a little. Any other questions? Well, we'll just I'll tell you a few more things as we go. I wanted to emphasize. It's really hard to talk about this without sounding awkward, but I also had a really great time. I mean, if you can imagine it, I made friends with these guys that are like you all from around the world. So a friend from the Congo and a friend from Nairobi and a friend actually from northern Uganda on the left so I could speak some of the language that I'd learned in Uganda. Um, and even our driver, the guy standing next to me, we all, it's like you're... Sort of like soldiers out at war, not that I ever did that, but you're just sort of focused and dedicated. And the, the group I worked with were wonderful people, and I would love seeing them again. I love getting a call again. Imagine having a friend like Harry from uh, Nairobi. You can just see the joy that's in his heart. And we had great talks about all of these things. Or these two doctors, um, on your right is a Sierra, Sierra Leonean doctor, Dr. Mina. And on your left, a doctor from Pakistan. So I, I'm good friends with this guy from Pakistan. Now he wants me to come visit him. I mean, there's no way. He says, oh, it's safe. Don't worry. <laughs> no way. Um, but getting to know one of the local doctors was really interesting. He was great. And the system isn't fair. And he didn't like it enough that he eventually left. I mean, if the guy on the left got sick, he would be airlifted to one of the major treatment centers as an expatriate doctor. But if Dr. Mina got sick, 
he would be in our unit getting taken care of as somebody who's a Sierra Leonean national. Not only that, but the doctor on the left was getting paid five times what a Sierra Leonean was paid because the Sierra Leonean doctors had to be paid according to the national pay scale that the Ministry of Health set. <coughs> Whereas the international expat doctors were getting, either they were volunteers or they were getting a good chunk of money. A lot of those doctors were working to make that money. You know, they came from um, Uganda or Kenya or, or uh, Cote d'Ivoire, wherever they came from. I had a doctor friend um, from Ethiopia, another one who came um, from Romania and had been driving ambulances in Afghanistan. So she wasn't worried getting to, to this situation. She'd been dealing with, you know, warfare kind of situation. But what I'm getting at was the great relationships I was able to form in this six weeks because, you know, we really had intimacy of dealing with intense, uh, intense material. Uh, here's the guy who did the logistics. His name was Chabel. I, I mean, if you ever do this kind of work, make friends with the person who does logistics because he had a whole bag full of internet dongle connections through your laptops. And, you know, he gave me one to use to, to stay in touch um, and whatever else I needed. So make friends with the cook, make friends with the logistics. Um, the last comment I was, I was thinking of was uh, prompted by a Christmas card I got from this gray-haired guy at the way back who was one of my early AIDS patients and has been an AIDS activist since. I mean, I really met him in 1983. So, I mean, he really has uh, grown up as, as I did with the epidemic. And he said to me right away, you know, the reactions, the fears are so reminiscent of this early AIDS experience. So I'm just starting to think in my mind what the, what the comparisons are, that these were new pathogens that came out of Africa that we weren't sure of one way or another, people are still worried about is the bullet spread in the air or is it really just droplet contamination? Um, that was all worry back with HIV. Um, we had no good treatments for HIV like we don't yet for Ebola, although there are lots of experimental antivirals. It can be fatal, but in really different ways. And then um, how the patient often would get separated from their family, that was really painful to watch in the Ebola situation. I mean, imagine if you did get sick, then all of a sudden the right thing was for all your loved ones to leave you alone. Or imagine one of your loved ones got sick and that you had to stay back rather than, you know, if you're a mother wanting to comfort your child or give your child fluids, really a challenge. And then the stigma and fear, the, the way borders got closed. We had a little child get discharged and... Um, when he went back to his village, they wouldn't accept him. They threw stones at him. And he came back to the treatment unit wanting to live there, and we had to get social services to help him find a place to live. So they're not all the same. Um, Ebola is spread so horribly in families, like we were talking about. So you'd have somebody who was sick, whose a woman who's lost three kids and lost her husband and lost her mother, and now she's finally coping with this. You know, nine people in a family would not be an extraordinary number who would die from this. Um, obviously, HIV spread differently, although Ebola is spread sexually. It's in high numbers in semen and in vaginal secretion. So even after people are, are cured and no longer sick and discharged, they're told they could spread it sexually and they should use condoms for we don't know how long, at least three months. So these are some of the things uh, that were different in my mind. So if you're thinking about doing this, what did I want you to walk home with? Well, number one, in the future or now, to really think about your timing. You know, when you call one of these places, IMC said, well, can you leave, what, 72 hours? What do you need? And they really wanted people right away. So are you ready to jump into something like that? Um, really looking at the risk you might be taking and having a discussion with your family. Um, my son's a medical student, and he was wanting to know about this and that and concerned, and then, okay, it's going to be okay um, once we figured out it would be. Um, be prepared for this horrible disease. I mean, this is not a, a, a simple thing. It's probably one of the worst things I've ever seen in terms of just walking into a place where I'm talking to somebody yesterday and today they're laying on the floor dead. I mean, what happened? It just happens like that. Um, this debate that um, Dr. Berman raised of whether we're really just managing cases and containing them or whether we can get involved more in treatment, even if that's just the supportive care that we know how to do better. Um, you know, before I went over there, I was reviewing the doses of the different vasopressors, things to raise the blood pressure, because I hadn't used them. Uh, they didn't have anything like that there for me to worry about, but at least I reviewed the doses of that. Um, 
The idea is you have protocols for everything, and you learn those protocols, and you follow those protocols, and you don't start making exceptions. We had one guy who couldn't quite get his mask on to cover everything. I showed you that little skin sewing. So he started putting tape on both sides, and it was sort of okay, because he was covering his skin better, but taking the tape off was going to be a trick. But what I wanted to tell you is within two days, everybody wanted to put tape. And there was a fad for a day until we put a clamp down and said, no, you, most faces don't need that tape, and it's going to be a risk. Don't do it. We've got these protocols. Follow them, and don't think you've got a better idea. You're going to change them. It's really not the time for creative input. It's the time for everybody sticking together and following. And then lastly, how we should be dealing with this here in the U.S., you know, when I see the Boulder Community Hospital, I mean, it has got all these PPE suits, and they've got all these protocols, but they don't have a team that's practicing them. It worries me. You know, the team has gone through it a couple times, but unless you really get the muscle memory of how to put this stuff on and take it off correctly, it's a real challenge. And so I think most of the care ought to get concentrated in tertiary and even national centers and not... You know, that the family doctor I see in Boulder who works for a community hospital who has got six PPE outfits in his clinic to deal with somebody. I mean, I don't think that's necessary. I think you can ask the screening questions about travel. You can take people's temperatures. And if there's any worry, you immediately isolate them and call for help and get the CDC involved and get this person moved to a center that's set up to... to I, I actually had arranged when I came back and had my three weeks of self-monitoring that I'd come here to University Hospital if I got sick rather than Boulder Community because I just wanted to cut to the chase. Um, and I didn't mention that, but that is a whole thing we could talk more about is this three weeks of watching yourself once you come home. Um, some states have been more uptight about it. I knew that I flew through Dulles. Washington, D.C. was pretty okay. And Colorado, they've been great in Boulder County. You know, that somebody came every day and checked my temperature. Um, and then the second time they did it in the day by phone. But it was really accommodating me and my needs and, you know, wasn't in any way um, adversarial. Had I said, no, I don't want you to check my temperature, they could have gotten a quarantine and done what they needed to. But I was cool. Okay, we're getting to the end of our hour. Are there any questions as we finish up. Here's what the unit looks like at night in the New York Times. Dr. Berman. Well, I may want to say what was interesting with IMC. We've had a lot of uh, relationships with IMC and in fact International Medical Corps were trying to sign a special arrangement <coughs> for university and children's to be to staff their field hospitals and emergencies for pediatric surgery. But what I was impressed, Charles, and I never told you this, is someone called me up for a recommendation for Charles. And I had never gone through a telephone recommendation that took 45 minutes. I mean, and that was all, they had all the questions. And, I, and what they kept coming around to, and, and given what Charles just said was, they said, is he a team player? Can he work well? You know, he's older. Is he going to come? Is he going to be too rigid? Is he going to feel that he has to be in charge? Uh, how does he work with people at different levels of training? How does he work culturally? I would say 30 of the 45 minutes was all about, you know, interpersonal relationships and, and communication and leadership style and, 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 and being a part of a team. And you could see from Charles's presentation that that's really what it was all about, right? And it was really about being able to trust other people. It's kind of like that thing where you're up and you fall backwards, you know? Well, that's kind of, you know, what going and working in one of these units was like. Uh, so, you know, I just want to reinforce medicine's moving in that direction and especially global health. And you really you can't be the lone ranger out there. You, you really have to learn how to get along well with people. And I really appreciate that comment. I'm glad that came through from what I was saying, because it was really true. It wasn't up to me and my hair and ideas of how to do something better. It was a better way to do it. Here's what needs to happen. You know, um, quite honestly, I got recruited for their other center in Liberia, which was already open seeing patients. I was just going to go see patients. 
when I got there, they said, no, you're helping this place start up, so you'll do some training. Yeah, fine, I'll do training. You'll write some protocols. Okay, I'll write protocols. You know, it was like, now that I'm here, I'll do what's in front of me. You know, it's not like, oh, but I wanted to, to take care of patients all the time. You know, it's like you do what's in front of you, and you pitch in, and you do. And there were a couple of things I do I didn't particularly want to do, but what are you doing? So I do. It is that kind of a team. Hey, well, uh, any other last questions? I think we're out of time. I respect that you guys all have busy schedules. But thank you so much for coming and filling the room.